right, Jeff, we are ready, Franco, we're, we are ready to go at exactly 9.30. Fantastic, thank you. So welcome everyone to the second day of the IMA workshop theory and algorithms on graph-based learning. And we'll start our second day with our first speaker, uh, Franka Hoffman from University of Bonn, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to join you um, in this online format so that I can participate even from the other side of, of the big pond. <laughs> so today my talk will focus on uh, graph-based algorithms for data clustering and classification. And in particular, uh, what kind of insights we can gain on the properties and the behavior of these algorithms by looking at the corresponding continuum, continuum descriptions. And um, so here's a brief overview. I will start with some uh, introduction to graph Laplacians and how they can be used uh, as tools for data analysis. Now, if you want to um, build uh, spectral clustering algorithms and semi-supervised learning algorithms, using graph Laplacians, there is a number of parameter choices that you will have to make, such as, um, for example, the exact normalization of graph Laplacian that you want to use. And sometimes it's not so clear what these parameters should be in practice. And so we um, gain some insights into, into these parameter choices by looking instead at the continuum limits. Now, there are several different types of limits that you can take. And here um, I will focus on a, a limit for which in the big data limit, so if you take the number of data points to infinity, we obtain uh, a weighted elliptic operator. So this is basically a differential operator, which is a continuum analog of these discrete uh, diffusion operators that are the graph regressions. And so this allows us then to do several things. So first of all, by studying these um, continuum uh, objects, we're able to also gain insights on the discrete algorithms. And uh, secondly, uh, once we understand the properties of these operators, we're also able to, um, we're also able to uh, de derive new algorithms on the continuum limit using these operators. And then I will also talk a little bit about uh, continuous semi-supervised learning, which can be formulated as an inverse problem, in fact, but it's a very ill posed inverse problem. And so instead we will look at a relaxation of that problem. And I will describe in detail what kind of optimization problem that is. And so some of you may be familiar with um, discrete semi-supervised learning. And then there's, I, I will talk about the continuous analog of these approaches. Now, most of the um, mathematical results that I will be talking about today can be found in these two uh, pieces of work. Um, so the first with Bamnet Hosini uh, and Andrew Stewart from Caltech and Asad Oberai from University of Southern California. So this is a, a recent preprint. And then also a publication with Bamnet and Ziren and Andrew that uh, just got published in July this year. Okay, so let me start with uh, graph-based clustering. So this, uh, this slide <laughs> I stole from Nicolas Garcia Chios. I don't know if he's here, <laughs> maybe he is, um, because I, I really love these beautiful paintings, but I think it also conveys pretty well the idea of these clustering algorithms. So essentially, if you have a data set, let's say n data points where each of them could be an image, for example, and you want to cluster them into K classes. So this could be, for example, images with people or objects or buildings or whatever you're interested in. And to do that, you would like that um, data points that are similar to each other end up in the same cluster. So for that, you need a measure of similarity between data points. And so you can record this information in the similarity matrix W. And so a typical cluster alg clustering algorithm would take as an input this uh, similarity graph. So you can now construct a graph on these data points using this weight matrix. And then the output of this algorithm should be the allocation of each of the data points to clusters. And now for spectral clustering, so spectral clustering generally uh, proceeds in two steps. 
So the first step is an embedding where you choose a map F that sends all your data points into a lower dimensional Euclidean space. So here just RK, where K is the number of clusters that you're looking for. And then in the second step, you simply cluster the embedded point cloud. Now the point of doing these two steps is that in the, you want to choose your embedding map F in such a way that it reveals the geometry of the data. So in other words, you want to choose a map F uh, in a suitable way that it separates the points uh, so that you can then use a relatively simple algorithm such as k-means to cluster the embedded point cloud. So then the key question of course is, what should you choose this map F to be? Or how do we construct this map F? And so in spectral clustering, this is where the graph Laplacian comes in. So the low lying eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian contain crucial information about the geometry of the clusters. And so we can then define this embedding map simply as the evaluation at each of the data points of um, the first K eigenvectors of this matrix L. So what then is this graph Laplacian? Maybe a lot of you know already, but I will just go through the um, construction because here it, it, it comes, becomes important. What are the different parameters and the different weightings that we're interested in? So we start with n data points as before that are in some Euclidean space RD. And then we pick a suitable kernel. So we use this uh, kernel to then disc mm, construct the weight matrix. So this is simply saying that if we choose a kernel that is radially decreasing, then we can, uh, we, we sim we're simply saying that points that are further away from each other are less similar to each other. So this is this um, W tilde. Now, the reason why I, I call this tilde is because I'm also defining a reweighted weight matrix W, which is simply the W tilde, so the kernel, divided by the degrees at the node i and the node j to some power alpha. And so then I can take the degrees of this reweighted matrix then. And so the general family of graph Laplacians that we're interested in is um, this matrix. So we take the degree matrix, which is diagonal, minus the weight matrix, and then we pre and post multiply with powers of um, the degree matrix that we can choose. And so why is this useful for clustering? Is simply because if you, um, uh, if you look at the inner product between a vector on the graph, so this is u is a vector in Rn and Lu, then you get a quadratic form. And you can then immediately see that the um, eigenvalues are greater or equal to zero, that the constant vector gives you a zero eigenvalue. And also, and, and this is where the clustering comes in, let's say if you have two disconnected components of the graph, then you could simply choose different constants on the different disconnected components and then also obtain zero as an eigenvalue. And so th this is why, and, and so then you have different constants on the different components and that allows you then to cluster the data points. And so the, this is why the, the um, second eigenvector is known as the Fehler vector. And so here's just a simple example where you can see the values of the Fehler vector uh, match the affiliation of the points to the different clusters, even if they're not perfectly separated. So that's the idea. And you can think of this graph Laplacian as sort of um, a generalization of the discretization of the, of the Laplacian operator. So people from the numerical PDEs are probably very familiar with these kind of connectivity stencils for this orange node in the middle. And now for a graph Laplacian for data, you might have something like this. Where, where here you see the, the points that are connected to the orange node are those that are within um, a certain uh, neighborhood Morning. of the orange Morning. node. Georgia. Sorry? Question? Um, okay, and then you can also rescale the kernel and um, uh, therefore change the characteristic neighborhoods of the point. So this would be now a localized uh, connectivity stencil, for example. Okay, so this is the general idea. Now, <clears throat> what I just said about the um, Dirichlet energy, of course, also holds for general S and T. And now you, is, you want your operator L to be um, symmetric. And so now we're using here a reweighted um, inner product. And then you also get a quadratic form in this way, just that now, your um, eigen 
Well, if you have a graph with k disconnected components, then instead of having the characteristic functions on the different components, you now have the characteristic, characteristic function reweighted with the degree to the minus t. And so this already gives you some idea of the role of the spectrum um, for uh, clustering. Now, let me talk a bit about continuum limits. So the, the, the idea behind this is that, so let's say that there is some underlying continuum geom continuous geometry here, and then you sample, and this is how you obtain your data points. So let's say I have this dumbbell shape, and um, I simply have a uniform distribution on this dumbbell shape, and then I sample from it. And so um, then I can, once I have my samples, I can construct the graph with the weight matrix as I described before. And so now if I sample more and more points, eventually these points will cover the whole space. And now if I look at the, um, the Fiedler vector, what you see is that essentially the Fiedler vector converges to the second eigenfunction of the Laplacian on this dumbbell shaped domain. And so this already tells us that it might be very useful to look at these uh, continuum differential operators to understand uh, the spectrum and then also use this information for uh, clustering, of course. OK, so now let's um, make this idea more rigorous. So first of all, we have to assume that our samples now um, come from a continuum data density. So we assume that we, we know the law according to which these data points are distributed. In practice, of course, that's mostly not true. Um, but then there are different techniques of how you could estimate such a row. But for, for the purpose of this analysis, let's assume that we have a row that, that we can write down and that, and that we know. So then this is the graph Laplacian that I was talking about before. And so if now I take the number of data points to infinity, all being samples of IID samples of this row, then this graph Laplacian operator converges to this um, weighted uh, differential operator. And you see that here, this operator depends on the data density raw to some powers, p, q, and r, uh, together with Neumann boundary conditions. And so what we want to do, our goal, is to understand better the properties of this continuum weighted operator. OK, so as I mentioned, there are different types of limits that we could take. If you just take the number of data points to infinity, and then you look at the eigenvectors or the eigenfunctions, what you, what you get in the limit is our integral operators. So in addition, what we will do now is to rescale also the kernel. Um, so now I'm, I'm localizing the kernel, uh, taking delta to zero at the same time as we're taking the number of data points to infinity. And so this is uh, how you then get this differential operator, not integral operators. And so uh, this allows us then to derive a relationship between these um, parameters s and t and alpha at the discrete level and the parameters p and q and r at the continuous level. And uh, so we want to understand then which parameters p, q, and r we should pick and therefore which, parameter, which parameters s, t, and alpha we should pick to obtain certain properties. And so this is the relationship between the s, the t, and the alpha uh, with the p and the q and the r that we obtain in the limit. And so this has been proven by uh, Nicolas Garcia Trias and Slepchev already a while ago in 2016 for specific choices of normalizations. Um, and since then, there has been a lot of work, in fact, also by several people that are attending here today on, uh, on these kind of uh, limits. So uh, I, I just, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the limits, I just want to give you some intuition why you would expect the graph Laplacian to converge to such a differential operator L. So here you see, um, I, I'm, I'm just taking the simplest example. So if you're in the unnormalized case, uh, so this is simply the degree weight matrix minus the weight matrix. And so this is an expression that we already saw earlier, just a quadratic form. And now I'm reweighting here with powers of N and delta. And now first I'm taking the number of data points to infinity. And because the data points are IID samples from raw, simply by the law of large numbers, we are getting these integral formulations then, where now you have an integral of raw x and raw y. And then the second step is to take delta to zero. And then 
you see that this uh, eta delta, our kernel, is then uh, essentially becoming a Dirac for x equal to y. And so this difference here is approximating a gradient. And now you see that this is essentially a continuous Dirichlet energy, where if you do um, integration by parts, then you recover exactly uh, the inner product between now a function u uh, on the whole space and LU in some weighted L2 space. And so here, the weight is simply rho. Um, but this depends on the parameters we choose. This is only, uh, so the weight is rho because we chose um, P, Q, and R equal one, two, and zero. Uh, and so it, it looks like this is independent of, of the choice of kernel eta. And it is in fact, except up to some constant. So this constant here depends on the second moment of eta. And so uh, this is one of the advantages actually to work at the continuum level, because then you, 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 the choice of kernel does not um, uh, influence your algorithm or the behavior of the problem in, in, in an important way. And on, in the discrete level, that's always a very delicate choice that one has to make in practice. Okay, so um, how do we then evaluate the performance and the consistency of such clustering algorithms? Um, so on the discrete level, this is part of uh, the, our paper that recently got published so essentially, if you have a graph that is completely disconnected, then of course, you know what the low lying eigenvectors look like. But now if I look at the perturbation where you have a connection between the clusters that is of order epsilon, so I'm calling this graph G epsilon, then you also expect that maybe the second uh, eigenvector, so the Fehler vector is not exactly uh, different constants on the different components, but it should be up to an order epsilon. And essentially, this is what we prove. So how do perturbations from the perfectly clustered case um, take effect in the, in the spectrum and the eigenvalues? And then what does that mean for clustering? And you can do exactly the same idea on the continuum. But now, the way how you're introducing um, a perturbation, of course, there are different choices. But so here, a natural choice would be now, instead of perturbing data points, we're perturbing the density itself from which data points are being sampled. So this is again a two cluster example, very simple, two circles. And so here you have rho, which is simply a constant on two disconnected components. And I can now to smooth out this function rho in such a way that rho is of order epsilon outside, it's close to rho inside, and then there's a smooth transition region. And I can now plug this rho epsilon into uh, the, the differential operator that I was showing you earlier. And now, of course, the um, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of this operator depend on epsilon. And we would like to know how they depend on epsilon, and in particular, how they behave with epsilon and with the choices of parameters p, q, and r as epsilon goes to zero. So this is, um, this is one of the key uh, results of, of, of that paper. And so to <laughs> the proof for this is actually quite horrible and quite involved and takes many pages and also uses, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into the details of that. So I, I'm just presenting you the result, hoping that maybe that is giving some insights. Um, so first of all, the first eigenvalue also of the perturbed operator is always zero because you can always choose simply the constant function on the whole set and that will give you zero. Now the uh, second eigenvalue in the, if you have disconnected components is the same story as in the discrete case, you can simply take different constants on the different disconnected components and you also get zero. But now if you um, perturb the raw, so then in fact you don't have you, your density supported everywhere, um, then the second eigenvalue behaves exactly with order epsilon to the Q. So this is where the Q comes up. And now, in, so this is the two cluster case, right? So in the two cluster case, what you would like in fact is that um, as epsilon goes to zero, that you observe um, a spectra gap between the second and the third eigenvalue. And now this depends on the choice of P, Q, and R. And this is really where it becomes interesting. So if Q is equal to P plus R, so this is what we call the balance case, then you have a uniform lower bound for your third eigenvalue. And then if you're in the unbalanced case, then you don't. 
And so here, um, this lower bound goes to zero with epsilon. I have to say, however, that I, I don't think these bounds are optimal. Uh, so they are optimal in the Q equal to P plus R case in terms of epsilon, of course. Uh, but what we observe numerically is that, in fact, if P plus R is bigger than Q, that you also have a uniform spectral gap, which simply means that here our lower bound is not sharp. And, but the upper, in the upper um, case, so the Q bigger than P plus R, we expect instead to observe a ratio spectral gap. So that means that um, the lambda, lambda 3 goes to 0 as the lambda 2. However, um, lambda 2 goes to 0 faster. So in other ways, you have only a ratio spectral gap. And then, of course, in the two cluster case, you have something like the analog of the Fehler vector is then the second eigenfunction of your operator. And you would like to know how this eigenfunction behaves with epsilon. And so you can look at the span of um, the first two eigenfunctions. And you can show that this is roughly equal. And so this roughly equal, of course, we can quantify in terms of epsilon. I just didn't write it here. Um, to the span of the indicator functions on the uh, two clusters, weighted by rho to the r. OK, please stop me if you, if you have any questions. Um, OK, so here are some images just so that you can uh, get a, a, an idea to illustrate the idea. So here, this is our density rho epsilon. So you see that it concentrates on two circles, and there's a very tiny transition region, but Rob Sidon is smooth in this case, well, when then you numerically approximate it. But, uh, and then it's a order epsilon outside, and you see that epsilon is really rather small here. And so here I'm plotting now the second eigenfunction for two different choices of renormalizations. So in the balance case, this is the sort of classical normalization that people use for the graph Laplacian. You get a very nice, uh, positive, negative on the different uh, clusters, and then close to zero in between. Whereas if, if we choose an unbalanced operator, then you see that there is a more smooth transition um, between the two clusters and in the rest of the space. Okay. And so then <clears throat> I have to say that to prove this theorem, because this is an analytical result, and it's already very difficult to do these proofs, even with a lot of assumptions, we had to put rather restrictive assumptions on the density rho and exactly how we perturb it. So it's a very explicit construction for the perturbation. And so then you could say, well, but if it's so um, explicit and special, then it's not very universal and probably doesn't apply in many cases in practice. So what we tried then is just um, a bunch of other ways of perturbing um, uh, different scenarios and we observe that even if these assumptions are not satisfied, this general behavior in terms of the spectral gap for the different choices of PQ and R still holds. And so here, for example, I'm choosing a mixture model. And so the size of the overlap is um, governed by a parameter omega. So omega here plays the role of epsilon, but the construction is very different. So here you have, for example, exponential tails. So it's not true that you have raw omega equal to uh, omega times a constant, which is one of the assumptions we make. And also in the limit as omega goes to 0, these concentrate on sets of measure 0, so the line at 0 and 1. Um, so these certainly don't satisfy our assumptions. However, you still see exactly the same behavior in the spectrum. So here we plotted the eigenvalues, the, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So you see these quadratic boxes here. These are, this is the second eigenvalue. And as we decrease epsilon, it goes to zero. And then the uh, third, fourth, and fifth eigenvalues, they also decrease, not as fast, but they still decrease as we decrease epsilon. If you instead choose the balanced operator, then we get a very beautiful uniform spectral gap, like what the theorem predicts. Um, OK, so everything I talked about so far uh, was about clustering, or at least the properties of these um, differential operators that we can use to detect geometric information in data. So now I would like to add labeled information to that. And so then we can design uh, semi-supervised learning algorithms. So uh, just as a very simple illustration of the difference between clustering and semi-supervised learning, if, for example, I have a bunch of animal pictures like this, and I would like to 
classify them which animals we see. Then if I simply do clustering, I would probably end up with three different clusters. Reason being because snakes can look very different. So if snakes are curled up, then they might look like this. And then if they're um, all along and, and moving around, they look very different. But now if I, if I want to classify, I would like our algorithm to be able to recognize that these should in fact be in the same class, even if they're different clusters. Um, and I will get back to that point later. Now, essentially what we're trying to do here is to use the geometric content, so the um, information of how the data is distributed, the geometry of the data, and combine that with observed labels to then uh, put labels on all of the other points. So basically propagating the labels to the rest of the data set. And so here, for example, is again our, our toy example, and we have some labels available. So here we have, we are looking for two classes and we are calling them plus one and minus one. So let's say all the blue dots, they have label plus one, all the red dots, they have label minus one. And now if I, without the information of the labels, if I just look at the field vector of a graph Laplacian that I can construct on this graph, then we're getting a very similar picture as we saw before. So now, and let me consider the scenario of binary classification, but everything that I'm talking about can be generalized also to um, as many classes as you like. And so we're assuming that we have J labels. So each of the labels are either minus one or plus one, and that the number of labels it is much smaller than the total number of data points uh, that we are given. I mean, if both J and N are large and nearly the same, then you can probably uh, use unsupervised learning techniques very efficiently. So where we are semi-supervised learning is really helpful, is if you have a large data set, but you have very few enabled points. And so this now can be formulated as an inverse problem, as I mentioned before. So if we assume that there is some notion of a ground truth, so some function um, on the nodes, so here that would be then just a vector in Rn, um, such that if we take the sign of these values, we obtain labels. Now, we also assume that the labels that we are given might not be quite correct. So we assume that these are noisy labels. And so we perturb our truth with some noise eta and then take the sign. And this is what gives us the, the label. So this is the model that we're using. And here, I don't want to make um, many assumptions on the noise. So you could choose the noise Gaussian, but you can also choose it something else. I will get back to this later, but the important point is that um, we do not gamma the standard deviation of, of the noise. And so now given this uh, psi gamma and given the labels, we want to recover the, the truth, so u dagger. And if we knew u dagger everywhere on the nodes, then we would have solved our uh, classification problem. Now, of course, this is very old post because there are many uh, u daggers they could give rise to the same labels. But instead what we, in fact, we don't need to find the U dagger. That's the key point. We don't need the U dagger. It's enough to know the sign of the truth. And so what we would like to do is then to relax the problem and design a classifier such that the sign of the classifier is converging to the sign of the new dagger as the noise of the, of the observations goes to zero. So this would be then a consistency result. Okay, so how do we define this classifier? So this is where um, probit optimization comes in. And so in a very general form, what we want to do is simply minimize a, a data misfit. So here, this is uh, a function that requires the sign of u to match the labels, essentially. And so then to this data misfit, we're adding a regularization term. Now this is very standard in, in, in optimization. And, uh, but here I, I want to point out something um, important. So I, as I said, we are combining the label information and the geometric content of the data. So the label information is in this data misfit term. And then the geometric content of the data is part of this um, uh, convex regularization here. And the way how we enter it is through the graph Laplacian. And so here, of course, this looks a bit more complicated than the graph Laplacian, and I will explain why, but essentially what we want is that this can be understood 
also in a Bayesian framework. And so for that, we would like to make sense of this matrix here as the inverse of a covariance matrix. And as you know, the covariance, well, the, the operator L, the graph Laplacian, is not invertible because it has a kernel. And so this is why we shift by a small parameter tau. And of course, we want to take tau as small as possible. And then we take L plus tau squared to some power beta. So this beta here is essentially just a regularization term and then we normalize. And so if you formulate your optimization problem this way, then you can make sense of this as um, a Bayesian inverse problem in the very classical sense. So then the posterior, uh, so the distribution of a use given the labels uh, by Bayes theorem is simply the prior times the likelihood. And so here the prior is, so this is essentially saying that um, this matrix, which we call C minus one, so it's the inverse of the covariance, says that U is prior distributed according to a Gaussian with covariance matrix C. And then the likelihood is simply given by this data misfit. Okay, and so this U star is then the, the classifier that I was talking about. Um, so let me just mention quickly about this data misfit. Mm, you, we can actually write down what exactly that is in terms of the cumulative distribution function of our noise density psi. So this capital psi is simply the cumulative distribution function. And then um, the phi, so the data misfit, is minus the log of psi, and then all this summed over um, the product of uj and yj. And so just, uh, I think it's always better to look at the picture because that's more intuitive. So if I take um, a data, well, a noise density, that uh, with gamma going to zero. So I let the noise go to zero. And then the cumulative distribution function converges to a step function like this. And to have the step function, of course, I need this to be symmetric. So this is why you have this assumption here. And then minus the log of that looks exactly like this. And so this means now that if I plug this into my optimization problem and I want to minimize, then I need the uj to be the same sign as the yj to minimize, otherwise I get plus infinity. So that's the idea. Okay. And then the other assumption that we make is that this psi is log concave. And the reason for that is because then this is in fact a convex functional and then showing existence and uniqueness of the minimizer is not too difficult. Um, and so then with this setup, you can then show asymptotic consistency. And this is what we did in this um, recent paper here. Now, this could be a whole different talk, and I don't want to focus too much on consistency today. So this is why I'm just stating the results. So everything works out when you take the noise to zero, then the sign of this classifier, so the minimizer of this probit optimization problem converges to the sign of the ground truth. Um, OK, so this is, of course, a, a modeling choice to set up uh, this optimization problem like this. And there's other ways how you can do this. Uh, so for example, um, there's recent work also by Tozi, Luo, Stewart, and Zigalakis, who, who took a tau equal to zero and instead constrained the minimization problem on u being orthogonal to um, the constants. And so we don't do that. And I just, you know, both are valid ways of doing this. Um, I just want to maybe mention what this modeling assumption means in practice. So if you have a scenario like, like this with the snakes, then um, if I constrain the minimizer to be orthogonal to constants, then necessarily they will be classified differently um, because I don't allow this to be just a constant vector. Um, but then if I take, if I use tau and instead I just minimize over u and rn, then for example, we allow the case that these are in fact in the same class. So in other words, this constraints just simply means that you already assume that there is a certain minimum number of cluster or classes that you're looking for. Okay, so <laughs> this, is, this was all in the discrete uh, setting. And there is a continuum analog for all of this. Mm, so I thought I'd just summarize this in a slide like this. So this is our a discrete optimization problem. And now we can formulate a corresponding continuum optimization problem. Where it looks very similar, but the key difference is that now here I have uh, the elliptic operator L instead of the graph Laplacian L. And um, 
we're working in a weighted L2 space. And the weight here, I just put sub rho, but this essentially also depends on P, Q, and R. And here, the psi is essentially the same psi. Um, and then we, we uh, uh, minimize over certain H um, beta spaces. OK, but is it, I mean, you, now you're working with functions, you on the whole space, instead of working on values on the, on the nodes. OK, so here's the, the continuum semi-supervised learning problem. And these are things that we're actively working on right now. <laughs> so this is still unpublished. But I just want to sort of give you some of the uh, insights uh, that we understood so far. Um, so something that is really useful is that we obtain a kind of representer theorem for this continuum formulation. So what that means is that we can uh, characterize the, the minimizer u star of this uh, optimization problem by uh, these um, uh, Green's functions. So these Cx, xjj, they're essentially the Green's function of the inverse of the covariance operator, which is just L shifted into some power. Mm. And so this also means that instead of solving this really complicated sort of infinite dimensional optimization problem, once you know what the Green's functions are, you only need to find these coefficients a k, and you only need to find j of them, and then you already know what your classifier is. So this is really useful. And these a k, they can be found um, by solving an ODE. Um, so th these can be characterized explicitly. Um, and then, so once you know that your um, classifier can be written in such a way, we now want to characterize what these Green's, Green's functions look like. And so this is followed directly from Mercer's theorem, essentially that uh, you can write them as an expansion in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the uh, operator L. So here lambda k is the eigenvalue, the k the eigenvalue of the um, weighted elliptic operator, and the phi k's are the corresponding eigenfunctions. And so you already see that if, um, this is the reason why we normalize in this way, by the way. Because now if lambda k is 0, so for example, for the first eigenvalue, this is 0, then this is simply 1. And then the eigenvalues grow as k goes to infinity. And so that means that the higher k, the less um, these terms contrib contribute then to the, to the sum. OK, and then of course, we can also look at uh, consistency taking gamma to 0. And there, it turns out that um, there is a crucial um, it is crucial to know the relationship between epsilon and tau. So I, I, I just want to give a general comment on this. <clears throat> so the epsilon is, in practice, something that we don't know. Because so epsilon characterizes the size of the perturbation in the data from a perfectly clustered scenario. And in practice, we, we usually don't know what that is. But it is there somehow. Now, the tau is something that is a model parameter that we explicitly introduce into the problem. So we can choose the tau. And so in practice, we would have to, for example, uh, tune for the tau parameter. But um, what we find by looking at the consistency analysis is that you, have to, you cannot choose the tau too small. So you want that the epsilon to the q is uh, less than tau squared. Um, and then, of course, looking at the uh, looking at the spectrum, we see that what we should be using is a balanced operator, so q equal to p plus r. Um, and then, so yeah, there's a lot of parameters here, the tau, the beta, the p, the q, and the r, and all of them have to be tuned or chosen in some way in practice. Um, so how am I doing on time? Yeah, I think uh, I still have some time to show you a little application. So this, um, we were just playing around to see what we can do with this formulation. Uh, so we didn't initially think uh, to use this for image segmentation. But essentially, uh, instead of thinking of raw as some data density that you have to approximate or construct from data that is given to you, instead, you could simply use an image. So if I have a grayscale image, I can use these gray values as my raw, essentially, and um, then use this kind of optimization problem to do image segmentation. So here's an example of two neurons. And you can see that they get pretty close to each other. Um, and then 
we, we work with a very small number of labeled pixels. So here just two, one for each neuron. And then we want to detect where the neurons are. And so here we're using, because we want to use the balanced operator, we picked a one, two, and one. And then we solve the continuum probit optimization problem just using an eigenvalue problem solver in Phoenix. And so then this is how we obtain the U star. And this really allows us to segment the image and identify the neurons quite nicely. And so you see, this is the classifier that we get. And it's a very nice, it's very clean. And it's, it can very nicely distinguish even in the areas where they get close. And so th this of course comes, um, you see that the second eigenfunction is, um, it basically gives you the classifier, what well, looks like the classifier. And then the third eigenfunction is this little um, region here, which is noise, in fact, in the original image. So in this case, it worked out very nicely that it can separate where the neurons are and where the noise is. But it might not always work that well. As I said, this was just um, playing around and we figured out that this uh, works quite well. So I think I will... Um, start to conclude since I'm nearly at the end of my time and I don't want to overrun, but let me um, summarize. So there's many things of course still to do here and this is just really the beginning of a story, I think. Um, first of all, there's, so we now have something that could be a useful formulation for continuum semi-supervised learning algorithms, but of course to analyze the properties of such an algorithm, in terms of parameters, choices, the consistency, and so on. This is something we're actively working on right now. And then an important question is performance. So in the sense, how does such a continuum uh, algorithm perform or how useful is it compared to other algorithms on different types of problems? So if you um, have, I mean, in general, solving a finite dimensional problem is easier than solving an infinite dimensional problem, of course. However, if you have many, many data points, so in the, really in the setting of big data, then your matrix L is n by n, and you have to look at the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this, so it's quite expensive. So if you want to instead um, solve the continuum optimization problem, what you, you can choose a discretization. I mean, there are different ways how to use it, you could, how to do it. You could make use of the representer theorem, which is essentially gives you a dimension reduction, from infinitely many dimensions to J dimensions, because you saw that we can represent the classifier U star simply as a, a sum with J terms, or you could simply solve um, the optimization problem in its full glory using maybe finite element methods or whichever method you, you like. And so um, that could be more efficient in some cases and will certainly not be more efficient in other cases. So this is something to investigate, of course. And then um, I talked, as I said, about a very specific construction of uh, perturbation for raw, for the spectral analysis, for the perturbation analysis. And also I, I focused on the two cluster case. But then you can do this for as many clusters as you like. And for the perturbation of the spectrum, we uh, didn't do this analysis, I mean, for the theory, but we looked at uh, a lot of numerics and this is how we came up with this conjecture, which we would like to prove in the future if we're able to. So if you have K clusters, then we would expect the first K eigenvalues to be small. And in fact, the Kth eigenvalue to be of order epsilon to the Q. And then we expect the gap, so the ratio gap between the Kth and the k plus first um, eigenvalue to be of the order epsilon to the minimum of q and p plus r. So what that means is that if, if q is equal to p plus r, so in the balance case, then you can say this is epsilon to the q, so the same order as sigma k, which essentially means that you have a uniform spectral gap. If um, q is, I think, yeah, q is less than p plus r, then you also get epsilon to the Q here, and then you also should get a uniform spectra, the spectral gap, which is in fact stronger than what we obtained in our theoretical results so far. And then if you have um, Q bigger than P plus R, then you should only get a ratio spectral gap. Okay, and then of course, um, 
then very interesting it would be to, to apply this to any different applications. Okay, and I think my time is up, so I will stop here. Great talk, thank you very much. Uh, any questions for uh, Franca? So please uh, type your question in the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute. Okay, there is uh, one question and uh, let me maybe uh, unmute uh, Shiant. Oh, I saw there were some things in the chat, but I couldn't look at yeah. it while I was talking. <laughs> Hello? Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Hi, uh, th yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, I just had a question. Um, when you, in your seminar, supervised learning problem, when you add noise to corrupt your labels, can you incorporate kind of non-IID noise as well? And then how does this change your optimization problem um, if it changes it at all? That's a very good question. And, and the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> So this would be another interesting extension, I think, to, to look at. No, we, we haven't looked at this at all. OK. So it would definitely be an interesting question. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I ask quickly, um, have you thought about rates of convergence? Um, in which sense? For the perturbation analysis or from the discrete to continuum? So I was thinking in the so I was thinking in the perturbation analysis, but actually kind of I think you you proved right that um, yeah my understanding was that you did this perturbation analysis right you did it for the discrete and for the continuum so I'm wondering do you also have like the um, I guess the yeah the rates of convergence there um, in between um, no so I even um, a more basic question, so the rate of convergence just of the operators, right? We, we didn't do it yet, although it should be just a simple generalization of the work by, well, Nicolas Garcia Trios and, and team, <laughs> which you're probably also part of. Um, yeah, so for the perturbation, the way how we did it in the discrete is very different from the way how we did it in the continuum. And this is exactly a question that we were asking ourselves, because so far we have not found a good analog of how to do the perturbation that would that you could sort of continuously take from the discrete level to the continuum level. So in, in, the, in the discrete setting, what we did is we simply perturbed the weight matrix. So you take a weight matrix um, that has disconnected components, and then you add an order epsilon to it. And so there you got a perturbed weight matrix. Or you can add you know, different ways of perturbing, but you're essentially just adding terms with different orders of epsilon. So, but then for the um, continuum problem, you're actually perturbing the density itself. And so now each time you sample, you might get something else. And the points that you sample from the density, uh, the way how they are different from a sample from a raw epsilon at a different epsilon uh, are not necessarily related to the, I mean, how do you character that, characterize that in terms of the size of the epsilon? So this is one of the things we thought about, but we haven't yet found a good way for doing this. So if you have any ideas on this, then yeah, it would be another. Not, not off the top of my head. Okay, I see. Oh, sorry, was that Nicholas? Was that, um, okay, so, yeah, so, okay, so I see. So, so it's different like um, perturbation models in the discrete and the continuum. So I guess otherwise, do you have a rate of convergence just in the continuum model? Because I guess if you did, I mean, okay, then you would, if you used for the perturbation, made, you mean? Yeah. Yes. So, so for did, the perturbation, we have explicit rates. So as you see here, right? So you have the rates in terms of epsilon. Is that what you mean? Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I guess so. I mean, I think I was talking about it's an earlier slide. I can't remember if you had it in that. I think it was slide 14. If I well, that one. Yeah, okay, yeah, so I guess on this right hand side, this was. Uh... Okay. Uh, sorry, did it answer your question? I'm not... Yeah, I, th I think my questions, my, I, I feel like my question has been answered. It was either okay. my question <laughs> might not have been well posed. Uh... And um... we could also continue later.
discussion. Uh, are there any other questions to Franca? If not, maybe we could uh, be pushed to the uh, breakout room and continue discussion there. Sounds good. Thank you.